Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us for another Legacy Tree Live broadcast. My name is Amber Brown, Marketing Manager for Legacy Tree Genealogists. And today I'm joined by one of our very talented researchers, Denise Payton, and she's actually joining us via remote broadcast. So Denise, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you taking the time. Um, as you know, February is Black History Month in the United States. And so in honor of this, we're focusing our Legacy Tree Live broadcast on African-American genealogy research and answering questions User submitted on our website at legacytree.com slash live. Um, we did a, a broadcast on Southern US research several months ago and received quite a few African American genealogy research questions and so felt it necessary to address an entire broadcast specific to this area of research because there are so many difficult research questions that are involved. Um, so Denise, thank you for being here with us to answer these questions. Um, we received a lot of questions, so we're gonna go ahead and jump right in and not waste any time we can try to get to as many questions as possible in the next 30 minutes. Okay. Um, so before we get to our user submitted questions, Denise, just answer for us really uh, in general terms, um, why is African American genealogy research so difficult? What are the obstacles that individuals have to overcome? And do you have advice on how to overcome these obstacles? Well, Amber, certainly one of the greatest obstacles experienced in African American research is the potential for unreliable surnames and vital records information. Mm -hmm. For those who research formerly enslaved individuals, the lack of vital records, the birth, marriage, and death records prior to emancipation pose a real roadblock for researchers. Knowledge of surname origins can pose obstacles to identifying or validating appropriate family members. Oral family history may report a specific surname and vital dates based on common knowledge from family members. However, those who did not know the subject individuals firsthand may be relying on that common knowledge being the last surname or the last surname of the last slaveholder. Right. So that's something that we have to take into account. Um, also, we need to be aware that many individuals assumed the surname of their mother's last slaveholder or the slaveholder who held both her and them as children in slavery, rather than to assume the different surname of a birth father. So mm -hmm. that gives us two different research paths uh, first, we have to identify what those two different surnames may be. And then secondly, we are researching individuals in an, one immediate family who may be uh, using two different surnames at, at any given time or on any given record. So uh, right. it becomes a, a, a challenge for us. Um, <clears throat> our research strategy must involve searching for the respective family and their neighbors and close associates because these people may represent family members using different surnames. We must remember to be flexible when analyzing records relevant to our family, families and research goals. Although some of us are fortunate enough to have oral family history, we must research for records relevant to that oral information to prove or disprove the validity of the information so that we can keep ourselves on an appropriate research track. Right. We can easily derail our research by not examining conflicts and searching to retrieve records with direct or indirect evidence to document our family relationships. When we come upon information that looks like a conflict to us, we need to stop, maybe do some additional research to help us resolve those before moving on so that we stay on our path. Right, do your due diligence and prove that you're on the right path before right. you continue researching and wasting time on something that's not even accurate. Yeah, that exactly. makes sense. Exactly, exactly, yes. So to counter some of the roadblocks experienced in African-American research, we need to develop research strategies that include searching for records relevant to distant family members, neighbors, and close associates. The extension of this research activity includes searching for census schedules, wills, probate, tax assessments, deeds, and other court records that are pertinent to either an identified or a potential or suspected slaveholder. 
These records mm -hmm. often provide information naming enslaved individuals by given name and sometimes approximate ages, and if we're lucky, sometimes a physical description as well. Slaveholder documents are an advantage to our research as they may provide direct and indirect evidence that identifies relationships for us. That's all really good advice. Thank you, Denise. And as we get into these user submitted questions, I'm sure you'll find um, that we are applying some of this advice that you've already given us in this first question. Um, so the, actually the first user submitted question we received was from Betty. Um, Betty, if you're here, give us a like or drop us a comment to let us know you're listening. Um, and her question was something related to a genealogy hot topic right now, which is DNA. Um, and so we wanted to address this because it is such a, a frequent question that we receive. Um, but Betty states that she's been researching their family history for more than 50 years. Wow, awesome, that's great. Um, and she thought she knew her ancestral background quite well until to her surprise, she took a DNA test, had it analyzed to support her research, and she found out that she had 1% African-American history. Um, having a mix of French, Scottish, English, Scandinavian, and Métis ancestry, this was more than a surprise. So, Denise, talk to us about DNA results uh, and what we do when we find these kind of surprises in our results. Okay. Uh, depending on the testing company, 1% ethnic admixture from a specific region could be either background noise or it could mm -hmm. indicate a distant relationship. And that relationship would be at least at the level of a fourth great grandparent or maybe even more distant than that. Yeah, that's so true. Um, and to speak to that, um, each DNA testing company is a little bit different. Uh, they organize their regions differently depending on how they collect the data. Uh, and so it's a good idea to educate yourself on each company's standards and what they use to break down those ethnicity um, results. Um, and we have a blog article on our blog that speaks to, um, directly about ethnicity admixture results uh, and their accuracy and how to use those um, as you're doing your DNA testing. Uh, and you can check that out on our blog. I'll drop a comment, or sorry, a link to that blog post in the comments below. Um, so watch for that shortly. This next question comes from Daphne and she says, born in 1853, Louisiana, my great grandfather, Walter Hodges Goodwin was African-American mulatto. There are no records on him or his two older sisters prior to 1870. He was raised by his oldest sister and her husband in Alexandria, Louisiana. He was mulatto and possibly enslaved. His father's name was Thomas Hodges, which was shown on his death certificate. But there are so many men, black and white, with that name. His mother's name is unknown. I think she was also enslaved. I have no other information about his parents. No birth date, locations, death, nothing. His surname was Goodman until his marriage in 1891. Then he changed it to Goodwin. Where do I start to find his parents? Unfortunately, I do not live in Louisiana and am unable to travel there. So I'm trying to do this long distance and don't have access to parish records. Okay, so Denise, this is a tough one. Yeah, that's, that sounds very challenging. In this situation, it is important that you start with the known information and work towards the unknown, utilizing a strategy of starting from the end of Walter's life and working backwards. So you stated you already have his death certificate, so begin there. In what year did he did Walter die? Who was the informant on the certificate? Was the informant's surname Hodges or Goodwin or anything that you may recognize from your research or your family information? Mm -hmm. Try to locate the informant in a census en enumeration, possibly in the county and state in which Walter died and his certificate was filed. Start with the census schedules enumerated closest to the date of death for Walter. What information do you have for Walter's sisters? Is it possible that if they had different surnames that Walter may have been enumerated by one under one of their surnames at some time? Do you have census enumerations for the sisters, death or marriage records for them? Searching for sources relevant to his sisters may provide you with leads to available sources for Walter. Do you have a copy of Walter's marriage record? If so, what information is provided on that about his residence at the time, possibly his occupation? What was his bride's name and what was her residence? If it was a marriage bond, was there a name for a surety on the bond? And if so, take note of that and, and research that individual. 
many times we we have to go around <laughs> in circles sometimes to yeah. get the answer that that we're really looking for and then also make note of the parish in which they were married if it was a, a different parish um, than the one that you're used to seeing him in then that probably indicates that you you'll want to research records in that area too thanks Denise. and i think you make a really great point that can be applied in really any genealogy research situation where you start with the known and you work your way outwards uh, and a lot of times it's thinking outside of the box, um, right. checking things that maybe normally wouldn't be um, your first thought or impulse to research, but um, you make a great point, so thank you. Um, okay, this next question was really interesting and it comes from TL. And he says, some of my family members have a rare U blood type that is only found in people of African descent. Would I be able to trace my African ancestors easier using this information or do I still need DNA testing? In this case, blood type will not be helpful for tracing ancestry. While there is an ethnic component of this blood type, it is very common to African Americans. It does mm -hmm. not provide sufficient information to aid in genealogical research. The value mm -hmm. of DNA test results for genealogy are only partially found in their ability to identify a potential ethnic origin. In order to better use genetic genealogy test results to enhance ancestral research, it is important to perform DNA testing at companies where those results can be compared to other customers. When this occurs, it is possible to, to connect with genetic relatives, evaluate the types and amounts of shared DNA, and determine likely relationships through genetic evidence and traditional document research. There is very little that can be ascertained from ethnicity results alone. Likewise, knowing that your blood type is found among African Americans only serves to confirm your African American ethnic admixture. In order to aid in tracing your African ancestors, it will be necessary to perform DNA testing. Right, thanks for that question, TL. Sounds like you better watch those sales and get yourself a DNA test. Um, okay, this next question comes from Donna, and she states, I have found very little information on public databases. What other sources can I look at for information on tracing my African American ancestors? Okay, I'm not certain what you mean exactly by public databases, but if you're referring to the major genealogy websites like MyHeritage, Ancestry, right. and Family Search, it's true that there are limitations to what you can find using only these resource, resources in your research. The most thorough research is conducted by searching a record group page by page. Indexed databases like those at places like Heritage and Ancestry are not always inclusive of all records or individuals who may have been included in a certain record group. Databases represent information that has been prepared as a derivative of the original or copy of original records, but many records out there still remain in the court books, the historical books, or on microfilm yeah. and not necessarily online yet. It is best to access original records or microfilmed images of originals to evaluate the record as it was prepared at the time of the event or shortly thereafter. This may, be, may require visiting a library or archives in person or requesting a microfilm lookup from an archive or the family history library in Salt Lake City. Right. In the case of census schedules, if you know the county and year in which a person may have been enumerated, it is best to review the schedules or the images page by page if you don't find them in a database search initially. If you are searching for birth, marriage, or death records, try contacting the archives or courthouses that have responsibility for records of, of interest to you. Effective researching requires a serious commitment of time, as you probably know. Research where the available state or local archives are located with respect to the county and state of interest to you and inquire what record groups they 
have in their repositories and how you may gain access to those records. Inquire at county courthouses to determine what types of records are available for public review. Online subscription services are increasingly adding digital images of diverse record types to their sites. <clears throat> Excuse me. When searching in databases, use variations of an individual's given name and surname, um, a variation mm -hmm. of the spelling. If the person uh, went by a nickname and you know that, use that nickname in the search as well. And be flexible in listing a search location. Sometimes more generalized searches provide a larger range of options for us. Again, the search for records takes patience and a time commitment. Identify a specific goal to begin with, such as searching for a person in a specific lo location in a specific year or range of years. Sometimes we become impatient and load our inquiries with too much information or expect a full story to result from one search. Researching requires establishing our goals and conducting searches step by step. We can then collect our retrieved information and analyze each source to arrive at a snapshot of a life event from that. Perfect, those are all great search tips. And so true, family history research is not for the impatient or the no, weak of heart. It takes a lot of time and effort. Um, so thank you for that, Denise. Um, just real quick, if you do need a family history lookup at the Family History Library, um, we're happy to assist with that. And you can request a quote on our website at LegacyTree.com. OK, this next question comes from Roy. And he says, my great grandfather was in Bossier Parish, Louisiana in 1870. I have been trying to find out who he was enslaved by without success. His name is Carr Stevens and was born in 1835 in Alabama. Any suggestions on how to continue this research? Well, if Carr Stevens appeared in Bossier Parish, Louisiana in 1870, begin with the 1860 federal slave schedule for that parish and search for a slaveholder with the Stevens surname. You can include nearby parishes in the search as well. If Carr was in Louisiana in 1870. He may have been there in 1860 as well. Search for a death record for Carr to determine whether evidence of his birthplace or parents' names is included on that certificate. Often the informant of death certificates is a relative or close associate of the deceased. Searching for information about the informant may provide leads about your ancestor. Search for a marriage record for Carr, all, Carr also. Did Carr appear in census schedules after 1870? A search of the 1870 Bossier Paris, Louisiana census schedule shows a Carr Stevens born in 1836 in Georgia. Hmm. Now this conflicts slightly with the information that you have on his birth year and the uh, the birth state, but keep in mind, Alabama and Georgia were uh, our adjacent states. So there may have been That's true. some confusion in um, either the county or the state when records were were completed for his um, birth date and and his uh, his birth state. So you'll have to keep looking, and in Alabama, or Georgia may give you another option in terms of of searching for people who are related to Carr. Search for him in later census records uh, to be, and be, be prepared to find his surname spelled S-T-E-V-E-N-S as well as S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S. And you may also try checking the Freedmen Bureau's records. Uh, those are available at the family, at family search. They contain labor contracts, and if Carr ended up working for his former slaveholder for pay or as a sharecropper, there may be documentation of this in those records. Good point. And I like that you pointed out checking different spellings of surnames um, and kind of using that wildcard option, what different variations may there be on that. So that's a great point. Right. Um, okay, this next question comes from Kimberly. She says that she's been doing family history research for a long time, but that she's hit a brick wall, which, like we discussed, is very common in tracing yes. African-American ancestry. 
Um, but she says that she has found my third generation grandparents. Austin Sherrill was born in North Carolina in 1847. I found this information per the 1880 census. He married Jane Brown in 1878 in Caldwell, Texas. They have their marriage records. They had two children, Lily and George Sherrill. However, I have come to a halt in my search. I cannot find Austin in the 1870 census. I have searched endlessly for him in North Carolina records. The one unique thing that has taken place is when I look at the 1880 census, there is one other family that migrated from North Carolina to Texas. Amos Evans and Austin Sherrill were both born during the same year, and per the 1880 census, they lived right next to each other. I'm wondering if they are twins, if they're related, did they migrate together? They both had to be enslaved, being that they were born in 1847. I want to find more information about Austin Sherrill so that I can find his slaveholder and family. Can you please provide me with some tips as to what I'm doing wrong? Well, it's not so much about what you're doing wrong. Um, it's just right. a African-American research. Actually, genealogy research can become very convoluted at times. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, because sources tell you Austin Sherrill was born in North Carolina and you can't find him specifically in the 1870 census, um, check the census schedules for the surname Sherrill. And although some white people with that surname may show up, uh, take a look at their enumeration pages and the pages mm -hmm. very close to them because there may be some type of relationship. And you may find a, um, a black man with the given name of Austin, maybe not listed under the Cheryl uh, surname. You can mm -hmm. also try a search for a man, a man of color, given name Austin, and leave the surname blank, but include his uh, approximate birth date of 1847 and his birthplace of North Carolina, and just see what see what comes up. See if you uh, will retrieve some records or something that looks very close to what you have found um, in your research. So we have to be kind of creative when, when we're looking for people that aren't easily found in the records. Right. He may have used a different surname in 1870. We, we have no way of knowing that. So this may seem like a lot of work, but we often have to use search methods that take time and allow us to back into finding our ancestors. If there were white individuals with the surname Cheryl, they may have resided close to where Austin was born and resided before he migrated to Texas. So you may be able to, to it will take some time, but you may be able to work through and, and find a relationship there. It's possible that Austin just was excluded from the 1870 census. That, that happens in, uh, in many cases. Uh, people were not home the day the enumerator came into their area for any reason, right? if they were away from home working or if they were traveling or away uh, on an extended visit somewhere, they just may not have been included in the 1870 census. So you'll want to turn your sites to other possible records that uh, may give you some information. Um, we mentioned the Freedmen's Bureau records earlier in another uh, response. So you may want to look for him in, in those records, uh, mm -hmm. either in North Carolina or possibly Texas. Regarding your 1880 census question about Austin Sherrill and Amos Evans, <clears throat> being enumerated in proximity to each other. Many times people migrated together in groups, as, as you mentioned, so it may not be unusual to find individuals born in the same state in another designated area. Um, it appears that Amos and his wife married earlier than Austin and Jane based on the ages of the individuals identified as their children in 1880. The two men may be related or perhaps their wives were related. You would have to search sources relevant to both men to determine if you can find a source for their connection. It looks like Amos Evans had been in Texas at least 19 years before 1880 because his oldest son's birth 
was listed as Texas and he was 19 years old. Mm. So if this is accurate, Amos, or at least his wife, was in Texas prior to emancipation. This may mean that he migrated as an enslaved person to from North Carolina to Texas, or he may have been emancipated before the Civil War and prior to arriving in Texas. This may be an error, but you won't know unless you conduct a more in-depth search if you believe Amos to be connected to Austin in some way. A search of the 1870 Caldwell County, Texas census shows an Amos Evans and his presumed wife, Eddie, which could be a nickname for Edith and several children. So um, you, my advice to you is just to, to keep plotting along. Uh, yep. in, include diverse records in your searches. Uh, this is this is just like trying to to complete a jigsaw puzzle. We have to take the pieces where we can find them. So um, yeah, absolutely. So good luck, Kimberly. This should hopefully give you at least some additional avenues to try. Um, so best of luck. And if you do find that you need some additional help, feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to assist with that. Okay. This next question comes from Sharon. He says, I have identified the slaveholder of a man that I have been researching. I found the probate and will files from the slaveholder's records, and they mentioned the names of the slaves that he owned. Is there a way to find correspondence from former slaves trying to find family members after emancipation if they had been separated years before? Were there particular newspapers that published these inquiries? Did states, counties, or towns and cities have communication systems for family members that were trying to find each other after they had been freed? There, actually, there were many newspaper ads that, that were run that were placed by family members who were trying to mm -hmm. locate uh, their family. And I don't at this point know of one database that has been compiled to uh, give us the names of all the newspapers that were involved in that. I do know mm -hmm. of a website that's called Last Seen, Finding Family After Slavery. And they, are trying to provide information about newspaper ads posted by individuals searching for family members. I believe one of their goals is to digitize newspaper ads placed by family members so that those will be easily accessible. Oh, other, helpful, other helpful resources may be found through Google search for newspaper ads to find former slaves or, or some similar terms such as that. Another course of action may be to establish contact with the genealogical or historical society for the respective location and to inquire about ways to share that information that you have retrieved. So those yeah, would be great. a couple of hints. Yeah, perfect. Um, and I will post the link to that website in the comments below, so watch for that. Um, okay, this next question from, comes from Joanne, and she states, I have run into a wall tracing my maternal great-grandfather because of slavery and the Civil War. I know this is not uncommon with African Americans trying to trace their ancestry. Where do I go from here? When we brick hit wall, our brick, where do we go? Yeah. When we hit our brick walls in African American research, we need to step back and look at a broader picture. Uh, review the records that you have retrieved already and make note of other individuals whose names are included on those documents. Conduct searches of neighbors from a census schedule, witnesses or bond sureties from marriage records, informants on death certificates, um, just any individuals that you find in addition to your uh, family member on any of the documents that you've retrieved. If you have copies of deeds or a court recorded business transaction, search anyone <clears throat> who may be listed on that document as well. We can often find family members with different surnames, in-laws, close friends and associates whose record trail may lead us to more information about our family members. Attempt to locate potential slaveholders by searching the 1860 and 1850 federal slave schedules for surnames that match those of our family members in counties where family lived or nearby counties. Although the slave schedules only list 
the enslaved individual by gender, color, and approximate age, perhaps you can match a family member to a description of an enslaved person in a schedule based on some of the information that you have. Start with the 1860 census, since that is the closest to the time of emancipation, but 1850 can certainly be helpful as well. If you find the name of a potential slaveholder, check other records re relevant to them, such as the population census schedule, courthouse deeds, wills, probate, inventory, and sales records, and tax assessment schedules to attempt to identify any information that may lead you um, or help you research your African-American ancestors. Enslaved individuals and emancipated individuals may be found in personal property deeds and uh, court order books in court records mm -hmm. uh, when they have been emancipated by their slaveholders. So check for, check for those. The U.S. also enumerated mortality schedules listing names of individuals of people of individuals who died in a year previous to a population census. So begin with 1850 and 1860 in the, in the county or counties of interest to you to determine if you find someone who may be related. I have searched 1850 and 1860 mortality schedules and actually have found the deaths listed for enslaved individuals. In some cases, if you're really fortunate, the name of the slaveholder has also been written on the line uh, next to the given name of an enslaved person. So that really gives us a lot more to, to go on. Yes, yes. So 1870 and 1880 mortality schedules also exist and can be helpful, especially in those counties and states where death records were not required and not recorded consistently. But keep in mind, though, that the death the mortality schedules only list deaths of individuals who die in the year previous to 1850, 1860, 1870, and 1880 population census schedules. But it is another avenue for research, though. That's great. Great advice. Thank you, Denise. Um, okay, this next question comes from Erica. Um, she says, is there a list of databases with slaveholders' names? There is not a universal database of slaveholders across all slaveholding states. Individuals and groups have developed information on slaveholders that may include names of the enslaved for specific regions or counties and states. Uh, for example, Cindy's list has a listing of African-American related sites, databases, and resources that may provide information about slaveholders and records related to slavery for specific regions. The 1850 and 1860 federal slave schedules represent enumerations of slaveholders by county and state and listings by gender, color, and approximate age for the enslaved individuals. So if you know of a specific county and state, that would be a good place to start so that you can get a, an understanding of the names right. of the slaveholders in, in that area, both in 1850 and in 1860. And, and don't forget to kind of spread out and, and use or, or search for neighboring counties as well. The Freedmen's Bureau records are available at Family Search. And they include labor contracts, correspondence, all kinds of correspondence, letters, and some marriage records that will name slaveholders and name formerly enslaved individuals. Uh, it's not uh, organized by slaveholder name per se, but if you know the region or the county and state, then you can at least start off with that and, and search uh, those records. That's, there's a wealth of inf information there for people who are willing to take the time to, to look through those. Right. So these records don't compile a database of specifically named slaveholders. And the two suggestions uh, of websites don't represent only database, do not represent the only databases that res of resources that may help. 
Other projects that have compiled names of slaveholders may be searched online by using slaveholders in a specific county or state as search terms. Consulting with repositories such as the University of Virginia Library, Brown University, University of North Carolina, Georgia University, just to name a few, and some of the state archives in southern states may also be helpful. Great. Yeah, fantastic advice. Thank you. Uh, again, I'll be dropping those links in the comment section. So this next question comes from William, who asks, how would you research an ancestor that you believe was a free person of color? An ancestor who was a free person of color prior to emancipation may be located in federal census schedules. That's the population census schedules in 1850 and 1860, and possibly before. If, there's, if you're searching census schedules in 1840 and earlier, keep in mind that the heads of households are the only individuals listed by name. Free persons of color may have owned land and engaged in transactions that resulted in their counties of residence, including them in documents such as deeds or county court order books at the local county courthouses. Many Southern states include deeds of emancipation or manumission for enslaved individuals prior to the Civil War and emancipation. Consulting the county clerk record books, either in the deed books or the county order books, may yield information on emancipated persons. Um, if you're not lucky enough to find a, an index uh, of those court books, you'll probably need to go page by page. Uh, but if you have oh, a geez. specific, if you have <laughs> a specific year range, then that may help you to narrow it down. Um, so this is, where uh, you really have to put your your uh, genealogy armor on and and, right. and um, plow through the records page by page. But if you if you find something, it's it's all worthwhile. Records known as Negro free registers or free registers of blacks are accessible. I know in Virginia and North Carolina and possibly other southern states. When a formerly enslaved person of color was emancipated, or if they were born free, state laws required them to register with the courts. The courts then recorded the name, the approximate age, the former slaveholder, if applicable, and a physical description of the individual. These records were maintained by county of origin. And what I mean by that is I have researched Negro free registers in the state of Virginia, and those individuals eventually migrated to Ohio. So Virginia has a court record of the free register, and Ohio, the designated or the des destination county in Ohio, also has a record in their county files. Now, not all county in respective states have organized them and labeled them, classified them as free Negro registers. So you may have to, as I stated earlier in, in, in an earlier response, you may have to look through deed books and, and that kind of thing. Interesting, right. Um, <clears throat> tax assessment schedules are also a source of information for free persons of color, providing the county enumerated and recorded people of color. I have researched a couple of counties in Kentucky where free people of color were not listed, although I had other documentation showing me that they resided at the, in that county in that particular year. And also, even after emancipation, there are some counties in, in Kentucky, I'm only speaking from my experience, sure. where or maybe a year or two after emancipation, for whatever reason, there was not a, as they called it, a colored list of taxpayers uh, included in their tax assessment schedules. So uh, you may find them in tax assessment schedules and you may not. Very good, very good. Thank you so much, Denise, I appreciate that. Hopefully that is helpful to you, William. Um, we're actually out of time for today, Denise, um, but I so appreciate you being here. 
Uh, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, so. so thank you again for being with us here today. Um, before you go, um, everyone be sure to like us on Facebook so that we can share notifications of upcoming Legacy Tree Live broadcasts. And also be sure to subscribe to our blog. Each week we send out research articles, tips and ideas that are very helpful. Uh, you can also follow us on our YouTube channel where we share these Legacy Tree Live broadcasts as well. Um, thank you again, Denise. Thank you for joining thank us you. and um, enjoy the rest of your week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.